when we talk about being allegedly post-truth, post-fact, anti-science, all those terms are pointing towards a culture war on science and expertise. And of course, this culture war only gets amplified when you add a pandemic. Uh, COVID-19 is now described, uh, this is a recent paper from the American Journal of Public Health as our first post-truth pandemic. Uh, in this paper, the authors explain, this is a quote from them, how in our post-truth world, the line between fact and opinion fades being caught in a lie no longer guarantees negative consequences. And the phrase believing is seeing has transformed from a psychological insight into an accepted way of life. Although the roots of this epistemic crisis are clearly visible in the anti-vax movement and climate change denialism, COVID-19 may be our first post-truth pandemic. So what's being described here in all these sort of news clips and articles that I'm showing you is, uh, is, is what's being described as a culture war on science and expertise. Uh, it's taking place on social media platforms largely, but it is impacting all of us. So that's the dominant framework that I want to challenge regarding vaccine hesitancy in particular and public resistance to scientific claims more uh, generally. Um, returning to this previous division, uh, I'm going to argue that we are not experiencing a war on science or a war on expertise. I will acknowledge that it is tempting to see it that way when members of the public repeat pseudoscience that they picked up off the internet or when uh, patients don't listen to their doctors about vaccines, but I'd like to make the alternative, the case for the alternative framework, uh, uh, to, in, instead of the war on, on science, this crisis of trust, specifically um, public mistrust of scientific institutions. And I argue this case uh, more thoroughly in, in, in my book that I mentioned. So this alternative framework, this uh, crisis of trust, rests on a different conception of the relationship between science and society, which encourages different public health outreach strategies and also redraws the lines of moral responsibility for this problem. So the problem no longer lies squarely in the epistemic failings of the public. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, since we allegedly have a war on science, we can talk about and think about uh, the nature of science. Uh, whether you think the driver of vaccine hesitancy and refusal is the public's low scientific literacy or some kind of malicious and willful science denialism and anti-expertise, these explanations share something in common. They share a grounding assumption about the role of science in democratic decision-making. So here it is. Um, in both of these accounts, um, there's this thing called science that transcends partisan politics and a failure to recognize science as a rightful anchor in liberal democracies is damaging. So I use this image of a boat and an anchor to, to capture the assumed role of science in a democratic society where science provides, prov provides the war firm ground or the anchor for the swells and surges of democratic choice. A public misunderstanding of science uh, and, expert, uh, and de the death of expertise, similarly, they seem to untether decision-making from its rational basis. So whether it's a war on evidence or a war on experts, public resistance to scientific claims is similarly envisioned. It's a battle between established knowledge and everything else. Um, public health organizations are rightly are right to claim that they have good scientific backing for their directives. It's then assumed to flow from there that public health has exclusive claim to knowledge and rational policy. It's also assumed that the problem lies in those who cannot appreciate the science and the science backed policy. So that's sort of the coupling of the war on science thinking. That's the thinking behind about vaccine hesitancy and other types of published public pushback. So I am going to agree to the scientific superiority of the vaccine consensus view, but I will challenge the other claims that the best policies follow from the best science and that the public are the problem. So when what I'm working against here, when I ask, when I say no to the question, is there a war on expertise? I'm working against a very popular and admittedly tempting way of thinking about controversies over well-established scientific claims. 
disagreement over safety and efficacy of vaccines are assumed to be a war over scientific evidence. This is very common perception, common enough to make the cover of National Geographic magazine and repeated in many other instances. For example, here we have an account of the director of the new director of the CDC being overcome by emotion in his first agency-wide address, this was in March 2019, where he promised to use and defend science in his new role. He mentioned vaccine refusal as a particular challenge. We see it in other places. Politicians now find it expedient to take sides in this war, declaring allegiance or belief in science. This is something that we never would have imagined just years before, that you need to declare belief in science as some kind of political action. So I say this view of the problem is tempting because the description in many ways seems to fit. We've got uh, this uh, huge body of literature supporting the scientific consensus. We've got opponents picking out selective and often disreputable counter evidence. Then we have the publics caught in the middle, sometimes choosing wrongly. And the reason for public resistance to scientific claims like vaccines or climate change is argued to be that the public misunderstands the science, that they lack sufficient scientific literacies. As science communicators strongly endorse this view. And of course, parents do seem to be rejecting science when they explain their reasons for, for hesitating about vaccines. There's a lot of survey data and interview data where parents make claims like vaccines aren't safe, uh, vaccines aren't effective, vaccines aren't necessary. So they make these evidentiary claims in direct contradiction to the consistent message being offered by their physicians, by public health agencies, and so on. So this, this framework in that respect seems very compelling. However, there are strong reasons to challenge this pervasive explanation that the public doesn't understand the science, that that's the problem here. Um, and they are these. If, if misunderstanding and misinterpretation of the science were the problem, the provision of correct information and education would presumably correct this. We would expect to see a correction happen, but they don't. There have been many years, decades of well-funded education campaigns uh, that have not changed numbers of vaccines refusers and vaccine hesitancy is actually slowly trickling upwards. Another reason to think that poor scientific literacy is not the root of the problem is that vaccine hesitators tend to be well-educated, university degree holders, even postgraduate. So the more likely story is that those with higher education are putting their critical thinking skills to use. They're, some of them are reading the scientific papers and many more are allegedly reading between the lines to see what the establishment doesn't want them to see. So even if we allow for a few missteps in individual reasoning, things like cherry picking the data or misattributing correlation for causation, poor scientific literacy does not seem to be the key problem driving vaccine hesitancy. Um, I strongly hold this view, but I'm going to raise a potential objection. Um, maybe, maybe these efforts to educate people fail because the public's cannot be reasoned with. There's been cynicism over poor results of education campaigns, and this has bred the harsher view that members of the public don't just misunderstand the science, but that they are willfully anti-science and anti-expertise. Um, I mentioned as anti-expertise as possibly appealing to doctors who find themselves debating vaccine safety with their patients who read something on the internet and might even be appealing to some of us who can't seem to win arguments on Facebook. This damning suspicion, this, this damning suspicion that vaccine refusers can't be reasoned with is frequently seen as justifying very harsh measures in response. Things like physicians dismissing unvaccinated patients from their practices, so saying you can't be a patient here anymore, um, or severe uh, policy restrictions on non-medical exemptions for school um, entry vaccines. Uh, this is a quote from this article, Anti-Vaxxers Can't Be Reasoned With, a quote from an educational psychologist with over 25 years experience in the school system who thinks ultimately the only way to get people to vaccinate might be to force the issue. That would be removing the personal and religious exemptions that allow parents not to vaccinate and still send their kids to a public or private school. That is a surprising comment to come from a school education and from an educational psychologist. 
Okay, a little bit about expertise now. A casualty of the war on science seems to be our experts, or especially our scientific experts. This term, the death of expertise, was coined by an American political scientist, Tom Nichols. He's a professor of national security affairs at the US Naval War College. And in 2014, he wrote a 2000, uh, sorry, a, an essay in The Federalist um, by the title of The Death of Expertise, where he lamented, I'm quoting him here, um, I wonder if we are witnessing the death of expertise, a Google-fueled, Wikipedia-based, blog-sodden collapse of any division between students and teachers, knower and wanderers, or even between those of any achievement in an area and those with none at all. And he continues, a fair number of Americans now seem to reject the notion that one person is more likely to be right than something, uh, about something due to education, experience, or other attributes of achievement than any other. So Nichols concludes that the Dunning-Kruger effect is happening here. The publics think they know better than experts. And he gives many, many anecdotes, a book full of anecdotes of, of examples of this. Uh, and Nichols sees grave consequence here by denying expertise and thinking everyone's somehow got a point, science denialism and irrationalism can thrive. Now that's more on the popular side of, uh, of, of science and society. Um, I of course couldn't stop without looking at the academic work and see what's happening among academics, especially science and technology studies, which should be informative precisely because it researches these questions about the nature of science, its relationship to society and the status of scientific expertise. And in my research, it was and still is surprising to me that many scholars take up some form of this narrative of science denialism and the public embrace of irrationalism. Um, there are um, a number of well-known scholars who've recently wondered if the discipline's work over the past 50 or so years in critical science studies, showing the extent to which science is socially constructed, perhaps it might have contributed to this current frustrating situation where scientific experts are not seen as more reliable than non-experts and everybody's kind of got a point. Uh, Philip Kitcher has wondered about this, Bruno Latour uh, and Harry Collins, the sociologists of expertise, have, have discussed this. I'm going to focus more on uh, Collins. Um, so Harry Collins and Robert Evans are sociologists of expertise, and they wrote the book Rethinking Expertise to address this very problem of the downgrading of experts. And in that work, they initiated a new area of science studies working to reclaim the status of experts and expertise from what they saw as an unwarranted low position. And they call this the third wave of science studies. So they describe in the introduction to the book, this troubling societal trend towards distrust of experts. Collins later coined the phrase default expertise, which is the problematic idea that everyone is an expert or no one is an expert. Instead, we've got this kind of leveling of the epistemic terrain. Uh, he used that term in his 2014 popular science book with the very exasperated title, Are We All Experts Now? And of course he wants to push and say, no, no, we're not. So default expertise is meant to describe, uh, describe the sense of empowerment, the sense that every citizen is part of the game of science and technology. It's this feeling of a right to judge that ordinary citizens think they possess because science and technology are so fallible. So default expertise is supposed to explain the apparent reasonableness of telling worried parents to do the research and decide for yourself about vaccines and the energy with which some of those parents take up that challenge. Collins wants to save sociology of science as much as he wants to save expertise. So he plies his trade to provide a response to those armchair researchers or default expertise, the, the parents researching vaccines. Um, so what he does is he borrows from the periodic table of expertises that he had developed with Evans in that book that I just mentioned. And this periodic table, this, that's not a typo, it's table of expertises. It details the many kind of expertise that are available to us. He focuses on the contrast between two key kinds of expertise primary source knowledge and interactional expertise. These are the circled boxes on the, on the table. Primary source knowledge 
is the kind of expertise that an informed non-specialist can gain from reading scientific papers. Interactional expertise is different. It is a specialist expertise. It is the knowledge and understanding that comes from being part of the specialist community. So a parent who is well-read because they access scientific papers and read them, they can have primary source knowledge expertise on vaccines. But this is very different from interactional expertise, which is garnered only by those who are members of the relevant expert community. It's only this expertise that gives you specialist knowledge, this kind of knowledge required to pronounce on the knowledge claim in question. So the, the upshot here is that you can read all the online stuff you want, this is Collins' argument. You can even read the professional scientific literature from the perspective of an outsider or an amateur. You will absorb a lot of information, but you'll never have interactional expertise. It's That is the sort of expertise developed by getting to know a community of scientists intimately and getting a feel for what they think. Collins explains that if you get your information only from journals, you can't tell whether a paper is taken seriously by the scientific community or not. You cannot get a good picture of what is going in, on in science just from the literature alone. So Collins' answer to the question, are we all experts now, is, is no. Interactional expertise is that key concept. Um, even if everyone is an expert at some things, that doesn't confer specialist knowledge on everyone. Vaccine skeptics will often insist that they are experts on their children, but that doesn't make them experts on vaccines, uh, Collins would argue. Specialist knowledge arises from education and work and immersion in the community of experts. So it's best to leave the judgments of vaccines, vaccine safety and efficacy to the scientists. So this is how uh, leading sociologists of expertise reclaim expertise or to follow Nichols' death metaphor. This is how expertise is supposed to be brought back to life once the public comes to see it, of course. In this argument for the special nature of interactional expertise is the acknowledgement that knowledge arises in community. Uh, this idea that knowledge is social, that science is social knowledge, is key to social epistemology. Well, I know you know that, but social epistemology, uh, uh, as we know, construes human knowledge as a collective achievement, one that's largely shaped by social relationships. So science is therefore understood to be not a collection of facts or a system of language, but as a knowledge producing institution or institutions. And, and I, I'm sure many of you know Helen Longino's book, Science as Social Knowledge, which really captures this social understanding of science as being generated within communal enterprise. Now, going back to Collins and the condition that specialist knowledge arises in community, I think Collins' acknowledgement of the social nature of scientific knowledge is right, but it doesn't go far enough. A key feature of this communal or social exercise of knowledge building is trust. That's because all relationships are built on trust. So I want to bring in trust to this discussion about communi communities of knowledge, communities of knower, knowers. Um, I will show that we need to attend to the way trust figures into the social exercise of knowledge building. And, and this gets me to my preferred framework, which is, uh, which is the crisis of trust. Um, I want to take this picture of science as a community of knowers, something that Collins and sociologists of expertise confidently subscribe to, but I want to take it in different directions. So I'm going to characterize public resistance to science and the so-called death of expertise differently. I don't think it's a move towards irrationality or a reflection of uh, illiteracy or a war on anything. What I think it represents is a mistrust of scientific institution. And this, when you think of it that way, this new framing invites new directions for vaccine outreach that can be more successful than prior uh, educational campaigns and pamphlets and, and fact-driven um, education. So to make my case that the problem is poor trust rather than poor regard or poor uptake of science, uh, I need to demonstrate the ways in which science and trust are linked. So I'm going to present trust as endemic to science in knowledge creation, in managing dissent and disagreement, in consensus building, and in the legit legitimation of consensus. 
poor trust relations undermine scientific practice and policy in all of these uh, measures. So vaccine hesitancy then is a symptom of a trust deficit. Specifically, it's poor public trust in medical and scientific institutions. Because these institutions need public trust to achieve their mandates, public resistance is not squarely a problem with the public, but it's actually a problem with scientific governance. When you think about it that way, you, invites, you, you need to think about addressing vaccine hesitancy um, differently. So I'll start this expo exploration of public trust in science by ex describing what, is, what we mean by trust. Trust is a heavily theorized concept across multiple disciplines, ethics, philosophy of science, social theory, they pay a lot of attention to the concept of trust. In those fields, there's a particular attention provided by feminist theorists because of the focus on relational aspects of morality, of knowledge production and social structures, especially relationships involving imbalances of power between participants. So feminist theorists have been particularly strong uh, on these areas of trust. So the concept of trust is actually defined quite uh, quite uh, uniformly across these uh, fields, it's taken to mean having confidence or in someone or something. Discussions about trust in the context of science usually refers to epistemic trust. Uh, to invest epistemic trust in someone is to trust them as a provider of information or as a knower. When we trust a person, an organization, or an institution, we're judging them to be dependable and worthy of our confidence. Um, Torsten Wilholt is a philosopher of science who's done theorizing about epistemic trust. And he adopts s some of the work by the moral philosopher, Annette ba Beyer. She made a very influential distinction between mere reliance and trust. Uh, Wilholt argues that epistemic trust is more than mere reliance. Uh, it is the kind of dependence that makes the trusting person dependent on the trustee's goodwill. This dependency on other people's goodwill makes us vulnerable, vulnerable to being misled or harmed. So trusting others is risky, but we also know that it's unavoidable. Uh, this tension makes trust very ripe for ethical analysis. When we find ourselves in situations where we lack adequate information to know for ourselves, and this happens often, of course, uh, we need to trust others. And we know there's risk involved that trust in others might be broken so trust requires what's been described in the sociology literature as leaps of faith. Uh, this terminology, leaps of faith, can be traced back to uh, the classic contributions of George Simmel, but it's still being used today by uh, George Mollering and others. And this leap refers to the necessary bridging of an information gap in situations of risk. Epistemically dependent people will fill any knowledge gap with a kind of suspension or bracketing off of uncertainties. And the confidence with which the trustee leaps is captured in the expectation of the trusted expert's goodwill. Um, there's the additional expectation that the expert will be properly motivated to act. Confidence hinges on the moral character of the people we trust, not just in their credentials as an expert. Um, John Hardwig, the philosopher John Hardwig spoke about the moral, wrote about the moral legitimacy of the expert as a prerequisite for epistemic uh, dependency. Uh, so so in, in short, uh, trust is risky. Um, it is, um, it is uh, defined, the, the, the extent to which we trust is defined not only by the epistemic credibility of uh, the expert in question, but also our assessment of their moral reliability. So there's a moral dimension of it too. There's been qualitative research into parental decision-making regarding vaccines that have highlighted multiple leaps of faith that are taken in incomplete, in the face of incomplete knowledge and uh, anxieties that parents have over future unknowns. So parents' trusting leaps are taken or they're denied regarding vaccine advice from people they know, from relations of familiarity, whether they are peers, family members, or health professionals, and also with regard to their perceptions of the trustworthiness of the scientific bodies or institutions that at least the health professionals represent. So trust is a means of social cohesion or, or connection. Uh, the sociologist Barbara Mistel has argued this, and those connections are made through affective commitments or emotional ties. 
So what's important for our discussion about vaccine hesitancy is that it is not the growing mountain of data that are convincing parents to vaccinate their children, but instead a willing leap in favor of the scientific consensus. Vaccine hesitators and refusers situate themselves in different circles or spheres of, of familiarity that disqualify the majority view on vaccines. So there's actually a symmetry between the two. It is not the case that one side is informed and the other is not. Instead, they are moving towards their circles of interdependence and relationship. So these calculations, these moves towards in-group belonging are really not well explained by cognitivist perspectives on risk assessment. Instead, a buyer seems correct to describe trust as cognitive, affective, and cognitive. So let's move to trust within scientific communities now that we've defined the term. Um, science uh, is thought, is, is traditionally thought to be rigorous by being wary of trust. Instead of listening to authority, we examine the evidence for ourselves. This popular understanding of science made this alternative thesis that came out of science and technology studies and, and science studies around the 1980s sound very radical. The th alternative thesis was that trust relations make scientific progress possible. This was a push against the enlightenment ideals of epistemic individualism, where you study for yourself, uh, a push against radical skepticism, where you trust no one. Um, and from there, a compelling case was made for epistemic dependency and trust in science as being key features of scientific knowledge building. So scientists, for example, they'll trust in the peer reviewed knowledge that supports their own work. Uh, they'll trust in their collaborators to do, uh, to do each piece of the project properly. Uh, no one has the time or expertise to do all the work for themselves and to check every claim. Uh, this is not to say that hard data and logical arguments aren't necessary, but since not every scientist can do the singular effort of testing every claim, much of what we consider scientific knowledge is built on those relationships of trust. A large scale collaborations are now the norm in science and that illustrates this really well. Uh, science needs trust between the collaborators. You do your piece of the work right. I do my piece of the work correctly. We report honestly. And the communities of scientists that then read the published works trust that the peer review was adequately conducted. So behind the scenes, trust operates in establishing and legitimating scientific knowledge as true and universal. By universal, I mean true for everyone. Let's leave the scientific communities and move towards public trust in science. So when you move into the public sphere, we can carry some of those themes of trust in science to the exchange between science and the publics. This of course is the site where vaccine controversy takes place. Um, you see when you move from scientific communities to, to the relationships between science and the public, that epistemic dependency and trust are, are more obvious. They're not buried in, but they're actually quite uh, transparent. Members of the public, of course, rely on scientific knowledge to inform everyday choices and practices because people, uh, everyday people like me, don't have the time and skill to check each claim for ourselves. We will instead look to experts for advice. So when the channels of knowledge transfer, transfer and translation go well, this move from expert advice to non-expert action can go very smoothly. But we're talking about vaccine hesitancy today precisely because those relationships between experts and non-experts are not so secure. Um, members of the public are arguably well advised to defer to scientists with relevant expertise. Those scientists, of course, have interactional expertise, which makes their judgments more likely to be correct than our own. So uh, we can agree that the public benefits from well-placed trust. The challenge, of course, is knowing when trust is well-placed. The risk of harm of being deceived always remains, though we as members of the public can work to reduce that risk by assessing expert advice, where we are presumably unqualified to assess the content of scientific claims, we can evaluate the character of the scientific expert or the integrity of the institution that they re represent. And these, these second order uh, assess assessments are available to us. So members of the public will follow expert advice 
if we trust that those experts are both epistemically and morally responsible. And some philosophers like Hardwig have detailed those epistemic and moral qualities that are looked for in a trustworthy uh, expert. So the rationality of following expert advice hinges on trust and credibility. Experts must be trustworthy and non-experts must recognize them as such. That's what I mean by credibility. So relationships of trust mediate successful exchanges between scientific institutions and, and the public. Now, these relations of, of trust do not preclude disagreement and controversy. We know this from looking at the workings of scientific communities where dissent and disagreement is, is quite the norm. Um, it's even expected and science encourages it. Dissent and disagreement are seen as signs of healthy epistemic enterprise. So the good news is trust, even though trust does not preclude disagreement, it can help us manage it. Disagreement doesn't need to undercut trust uh, either. The avenues for managing uh, dissent and disagreement in science follow from a generally accepted democratic orientation towards truth seeking, uh, one that is public and accountable. Social epistemologists view these mechanisms very favorably, and they even make recommendations to improve the democratic tenor of science by increasing diversity in scientific communities in order to make dissent and criticism more robust. So bring more people to the table so dissent and criticism will be stronger and argued high, harder. Um, also, we need some limiting of spurious dissent, of course, ones that are meant to be obstructionist rather than knowledge seeking. All these kinds of efforts are made to make science are meant to make science better by improving the quality of dissent and disagreement. So it's with these communicative practices in place that robust scientific consensus can arise on some issues. While points of disagreement can still uh, respectfully endure without rupturing the community cohesion. Now compare this to public controversies over science and we see that the public stage is not so well managed. Um, we don't have comparable shared rules for the management of disagreement and for consensus building. There are no shared frames of reference. We seem to now have facts, alternative facts, which one is legitimate science, which one is junk science. We sometimes see conflicts of interest on both sides of the argument. The science controversy often isn't about science at all, but what follows practically from the science, from accepting that science is true. What policies will be put in place? Uh, how will they impact my livelihood and sense of well being? Uh, the philosopher Dan Hicks has described science controversies as proxy politics. We argue over, let's say, the reality of climate change, but we, what we really are arguing for is our way of life and the values that we hold dear. Um, this can be a hard realization for some that science can't guide us to good policy and right action, that science doesn't neutralize political partisanship and rationalize democratic decision-making. So it's actually quite shocking to many vaccine advocates that the scientific consensus on vaccines does not settle public concern. Instead, it seems to get positioned, at least on the public stage, it gets positioned as one side of a debate where scientific experts are moving and fighting for legitimacy against what seems to be uh, seemingly disreputable opponents who of course are claiming they have the science and the moral credibility on their side. And of course, I think we should appreciate that surprise. The scientific consensus is supposed to settle debate, not invite it. It's supposed to represent the majority view of those most suited to pronounce on the issue. And consensus can often serve public functions too, to educate the public on the issues and promote appropriate response, whether that's personally or politically. So the failure to achieve these aims by a strongly worded consensus claim is no doubt frustrating. Doesn't the consensus deserve more deference? It is after all the best approximation of scientific truth. It's produced by the best truth seeking pr procedures and practices. Uh, the universal applicability of the findings rests in its methods of consensus building. So for the public to suggest impartiality is to reject a very elaborate set of epistemic, methodological, and institutional mechanisms that are meant to ensure reliable knowledge and, of course, public benefit from that knowledge. Uh, science isn't supposed to be something you're supposed to believe in or to be against. Uh, to say otherwise is to say that science depends on trust. 
Um, and of course, uh, it does. So much of what this is this is the important takeaway is that much of what members of the public know about vaccines pivots on epistemic trust. Uh, I should say that same point has been argued about uh, the beliefs about climate change. Uh, ben El Masi has made that argument. So tied to the consensus, the position papers in medicine, the consensus papers on uh, climate change is a claim to the epistemic and moral legitimacy of its authors and their institutions. Vaccine hesitators and, and more strident anti-vaxxers reject those claims of legitimacy. So what are we supposed to do? What is the appropriate response when the consensus does not fulfill its function of engendering public trust? I can tell you what's happening now. Vaccine hesitators and refusers are ridiculed for raising concerns, um, for questioning expert testimony, for taking seriously minority dissenting views. Uh, against the democratic tenor of science, science journalists now write articles like this one on your screen. This is why you have no business challenging scientific experts to convey sincere disgust over the current state of affairs. Why they ask, um, uh, would, uh, why would you take the word of a media savvy celebrity mom who attributed her knowledge of autism to the University of Google over many scientific experts. And we know, of course, that the consensus is an expert generated directive for epistemically dependent outsiders. It's meant to offer scientific information that we need to know. But those mechanisms used to ensure the trustworthiness of that information, the negotiation of conflicting views at conferences, and in journals, replication of findings, peer review, and so on. These are internal to the scientific communities and therefore they're largely shielded from public view. So that final step in the expert lay exchange where if all goes well, the publics accept the scientific consensus view, it requires some degree of that trusting leap of faith that the scientific experts have done their due diligence and reported responsibly. The trust requirement places the outsider in a vulnerable position and there, no, there is no sympathy for that. The publics are implored to trust science, trust in a process whose trustworthiness lies in it being shielded from public opinion or from non-expert contributions. So without an eye on or participation in the innermost practices of scientific knowledge and consensus building, and with various threats of sanction for not accepting the findings, the publics are instructed to trust and some are not willing to do that. Now, some people, when I give these talks, I usually get stopped at this point and say, but what about social media? Why, why can't we, shouldn't we blame social media for this? Um, the thinking is uh, people don't understand the science, so they're misled by vaccine information. Uh, the echo chamber then amplifies that. We hear a lot about that. Uh, we even know that we're trying to crack down on misinformation on the internet. That's a good thing, I think, but technical solutions only fix technical problems. When parents make vaccine decisions, the trust in leaps or refusals are surely influenced by the misinformation that's peddled on the internet. Uh, this was uh, a report on a study that says just five minutes on the internet can sow seeds of doubt in vaccines, and parents do spend a lot of time on the internet. But those dubious claims that we read on the internet only gain traction because they fit within a broader narrative of perilous healthcare. Um, informed news consumers are well aware of problems in health research and practice, uh, the replication crisis, the weakness of the peer review system, um, profit-driven medicine, disease mongering, lawsuits against pharmaceutical companies are part of any health consumer's background knowledge. So parents draw on these narratives when they evaluate new information about, pro about vaccine risk. Prior trust will have some determination of whether they accept the consensus view or whether they turn to the internet to try to fill in the gaps that haven't been filled yet. Uh, the current climate of par parental decision-making is very difficult. This was from a report from the American Academy of the Advancement of Science where they nicely describe the noisy stage on which vaccine controversy plays out. I'm going to read it out loud for you. A welter of voices in medicine, government, politics, media, churches, schools, and among one's family and friends can confuse well-meaning parents who want to do the best for their offspring, 
Online forums or appeals to emotion often drown out thoughtful discussion also play a role in vaccination decisions. So while those dissenting and questioning and confusing views, um, voices uh, uh, do make the decision-making process more difficult, it's due to poor trust that the institutions tasked with protecting the public good are not able to carry out their mandates by guiding parents out of the fray and offering the definitive voice of reason. The consensus is not able to fulfill its function of guiding parents here. So there are institutional implications of this. Everybody seems to agree that the publics need science, but my point is that it goes both ways. Science needs the publics too. The fulfillment of many institutional mandates hinge on positive public relations. This is especially the case for policy relevant science like public health. You need a lot of buy-in from stakeholders outside of the scientific community. So you need to keep eyes on your relationship with the public. Um, um, so for example, um, scientific claims, uh, the stakeholders that would need to accept a public health directive are not just the, the insular epistemic community of scientists, of public health uh, workers, but you also need the public buy-in too in order to follow those directives. So policy direct policy relevant science can only provide those public be benefits if its institutions are regarded as trustworthy by members of the public. You cannot do your work if you don't have the trust of the public. So public health can only improve population health if the general public follows and accepts its recommendations. Um, these health recommendations and, and uh, consensus statements uh, bank on the public's trust uh, in the regard of their institutions as conscientious and honest in the effort to aim and protect. So earning the, earning the public trust and maintaining the public trust is actually crucial for fulfilling public health mandates. Offering the best science, the most carefully considered action directives are really not enough. The science needs to be trustworthy, sure, but it also needs to be trusted by all public health stakeholders. Persistent vaccine hesitancy indicates that an institutional failure to engender that public trust. And this warrants self-reflection about our own trust building practices within these scientific institutions. So I'll just, I'll conclude here because I know we're almost out of time that I've argued, so what I've, uh, let, I'll summarize, that I've argued that the evidence that most of the publics accept on vaccines turns crucially on epistemic trust and that it is poor trust in the expert sources that engender vaccine hesitancy. So consensus claims won't convince if the source is not perceived as trustworthy. So what if we focused on building that trust rather than educating the misinformed public or puzzling over their moral and epistemic failings. Doing this does not discount that public health agencies and institutions have the science on their sides and that the science is strong. It does mean that we have to recognize that the best science is not enough. This is not a war with the publics or a war with over science. Uh, I've offered a different picture of science in relation to the publics than the firm anchor mooring liberal democratic political organization. Science should still be understood to hold firm ground. I'm not a relativist about science, but the idea that the evidence speaks or dictates right policy is, is a fiction. All evidence is subject to interpretation and political and policy decision-making requires numerous non-scientific considerations. The language of evidence-based is misleading in that respect. Scientific evidence operates within a constellation of social influences that guide personal decision-making and policy formation. So good trust relations ensure that science stands prominently within policy frameworks. And so good relationship with the public need to be maintained, not as a secondary concern, but as a primary concern. The current tendency of criticizing the skeptical public for failing to appreciate the primacy of science, the authority of experts does not address the problem of public mistrust in scientific institutions. If anything, it exacerbates that mistrust by entrenching a very polarizing us versus them uh, mentality. Okay, and that's it. I will stop speaking there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Um, now let's go um, to the Q&A. If you have any questions, just uh, click on the reactions and put the, the finger that goes up. Um, 
So, any questions? Están, María, están en los participantes, todos levantamos las manitas. Si vas a participantes, vas a ver las manitas levantadas. Sí. Uh, muy bien, pues vamos en ese orden. Uh, Moisés Vaca, por favor. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I think I agree with you in most of it. I just have two very brief comments. One is, uh, couldn't it be that both things are happening at the same time, that certain groups actually have a war on science, like a specific uh, idea of trying to diminish that knowledge because of religious purposes, perhaps, or some other purposes. And also what you just explained, which is the fact that there is a lack of trust between the publics and, and the scientific community. So that's one thing I would like to say, whether you have to say something about that. And then the second point is, um, how can we promote, promote this trust uh, between the scientific community? Because it seems that you were talking um, with regards to the scientific community as something that is united somehow, despite of all these internal disagreements and everything. But the institutions that do science are very different in form, for example, private uh, labs or universities or hospitals or public fund funded research. So. The only thing that I can imagine right now, you know, just thinking about it, how to promote these trusts, is, is that the media has something to do with it. Like the journalists and, and people who ha are always in contact with the public to try to, you know, uh, put uh, the, the scientific community uh, again in a good place with the public. Thank you. Those are, those are really good comments. I'll, I'll start with the second one. So the first question, the, the, the question you seem to be asking is, that what is the scientific institution? They are quite diverse. So uh, I, I can't speak to every single one, but I can speak to the um, hierarchy of need in order, based on the extent to which those institutions face the public. So uh, thinking about uh, vaccine hesitancy among parents, parents, despite all the hesitancy that they have, usually go to their primary care provider as the first person they speak to about uh, about vaccination. There's a lot of narratives from vaccine hesitant parents that uh, when they when they talk about how did my journey into vaccine hesitancy or refusal start, it usually started with a with a visit to their uh, to their nurse or their pediatrician that went very badly, um, where their questions were shut down and uh, they were not taken seriously. They were pretty much told to just be quiet and vaccinate your kid. And it's from there that uh, these, these parents, usually mothers, let's say almost entirely mothers, um, feel this uh, burden of what's actually a historically an epistemic injustice against uh, women who are not listened to by healthcare providers, and they go and find community elsewhere. Uh, some of these anti-vaccine and vaccine skeptical community, um, communities are actually very progressive because they are grassroots, they're largely run by women, and they take the questions and concerns of women seriously. So my first, uh, my first point of reference is what can physicians do? Um, one thing they can do is uh, talk to women seriously and um, try to break down that kind of um, barrier that comes up. I know why doctors do it. It is frustrating for them and they are not remunerated to have, you know, hour long conversations. They're supposed to do this in five minutes. Uh, at the same time, parents vocalize consistently a lot of mistrust around vaccines because of pharmaceutical influence on medical research. And uh, healthcare providers, bodies of healthcare providers have done nothing to try to fix that problem. When the public is crying out saying, we do not like this arrangement, it is up to the providers as providers of care to create these distances between, uh, between uh, in, uh, corporate influence and the work that they do. There is that point where we need to say, we as public uh, providers of healthcare cannot provide the care we need if we cannot separate ourselves and work to, to fix these points of mistrust. So that's one thing that could be done. Then you move to the re regulation of pharmaceutical products, which is uh, uh, seen by the public as problematic. And let's be honest, often very problematic. We're seeing it again around coronavirus and treatment. Uh, the public are up in arms about the extent to which corporations are going to be 
um, directing our health care. And there's a lot of mistrust about that. So once again, it is time to look at these relationships between private funding and, uh, and, and health care. It, I, when I say these kinds of things, I know it sounds pie in the sky and and uh, overly optimistic to say we can just remove pro- corporate funding outside of healthcare, but we can, if we are properly motivated, create the measures to shore up public trust and to eliminate some of the very um, fractured uh, uh, fra- fra- uh, fracturing of trust due to breakdowns of regulation and trust in in the publics. So those are just some ways that we could actually effectively um, change uh, the relationship of science and the publics. Uh, And and like I said, it is focusing on those bodies that are closest facing to the public, not the ones, there are other research institutions that are a little more removed and don't have that kind of uh, relationship with the public to contend with. Uh, your second question, uh, also very good, about what about a war of science and public trust? Um, there, that is, a, it, there's no, no reason to think that there isn't uh, active undermining of scientific claims, for example, for religious reasons. It does not seem to be motivating vaccine hesitancy, which is where I work from and start from. Um, there, there are, are um, religious uh, groups and individuals who refuse vaccines based on religious um, practice but they are a relatively small group. The kind of public concern that we now have, public health concern over vaccines, have almost entirely to do with um, non-religious beliefs. And we know this because in many countries, uh, you have the option, if you don't want to vaccinate your children, you have the option of what's called a um, personal belief exemption or a religious exemption. And the numbers of personal belief exemptions have gone up, 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 up in recent years, while religious exemptions either stay the same and sometimes even go down. There's a few reasons why religious exemptions might go down, but they are generally not seen as a big public health problem. That could change, of course, but uh, for now, it seems to be more about uh, um, uh, public trust issues and less about a a religious war on, on science. Thank you for your questions. Um, thank you. Thank you, Maya, for this talk. Uh, it was, I think I agree basically with you. I just have a couple of, of questions. One of them is that I think that that um, when you give this big explanation about what can explain or what helps explaining uh, public resistance to, to scientific claims, uh, is that you lose from sight the local the, the the local problems because I don't think it's the same thing in the U.S. than in Mexico. Then that this where does this trust come from? So and I think that it is basic in order for your for your uh, image to work that you can take into account these these localities because if not it it is just a huge explanation. So uh, I think that one of the questions that one has to answer is. Where does this mistrust come? If you're right, then why is there this mistrust? And then you can think about ways to to fix it, right? It's not possible to to think of ways of fixing it if you don't understand where it comes from. So uh, I was thinking that probably one way of addressing this question, but I don't know what you think about it, is uh, thinking about reciprocity. Because, and I think that precisely that is one of the the worst parts of of the alternative account, because if you think that people have this, um, how, how, how to say it, this uh, resistance is because they are ignorant, then what you do is to put them in in a place where they all they want to say is that if I am ignorant, you are not uh, trustable or or however you say that. Mm-hmm. So reciprocity is very important, not just in that way of recognizing local knowledge and local ways of attending problems or thinking about them even uh, uh, like um, traditional ways of thinking about some problems, right? Like uh, in medicine, that is a problem and you have to address it. But also that is one sort of reciprocity, but then there is another one. And it is the reciprocity of people have to try to understand science, but scientists should try to understand people and not just in the ways they think about uh, about uh, sicknesses, but the ways they think about the world and their place in the world and about them, about scientists themselves. 
So I think scientists should start thinking about how are we seen and how taking that into account, how, how, one, how can we convey the information that is important for people to uh, understand uh, the problem. So I think that expertise, the problem with expertise is that it tends to think that people are ignorant and that we have the truth. And that that is not, that might be the case, but the thing is how can you take into account other ways of thinking about things and saying, well, there's a truth in there. I don't know if a truth, because truth is, uh, but I don't know if I'm making my, so I, that was just if you think that reciprocity has to be something that you bring into your picture in order to understand your problem. Um, I, th I think it does. Um, if anything, the, the framework that I, I'm suggesting um, allows for more reciprocity than what was done before. So what was done before was an, it was a sort of a caricature of vaccine refusers, which is which is um, a decided uh, ignorance on the on the part of vaccine communicators because there is so much research into vaccine hesitancy. Social scientists put a lot of time into this. There's so many interviews and uh, uh, um, surveys and done in many countries. And you, you, so, you know, these are usually small studies because they're qualitative, but they all give you a little bit of a slice of what's going on around vaccine hesitancy. So in my own research, I read many, many of these. I was, I'm limited to it, to English language sources, but that's, that, that there was still plenty there. Um, and it was, it becomes very obvious reading this, that whatever is being portrayed in the media as being selfish or ignorant or stupid it was, is not what was happening there. These were parents who were really cared about their kids and were struggling how to operationalize that and were even able to vocalize what was the struggle. And the struggle was almost entirely having to do with financial conflicts of interest uh, in medicine, making them uncomfortable. There were um, working into them were ideas about naturalness. So we, we could address that about why vaccines are seen as unnatural and therefore uh, undesirable when you could, you know, do organic food and and uh, holistic medicine and things like that. Um, um, another um, uh, another feature of the reciprocity that unfortunately was not uh, um, n not uh, visible in the literature was um, it, uh, was um, histories and presence of health injustices uh, against marginalized communities. Almost all of the vaccine hesitancy research is done on, uh, on uh, white people in Northern countries. So even communities of colors within Northern countries are being left out of this. And I tried to get a sense of why that is. And I believe it's because they did a lot of um, so it's sort of a convenience sampling where they go to a health clinic, leave the survey, leave their number, and they didn't actively recruit uh, people of color. And because of that, their entire images of who hesitates and why was, was the reflections of only people who largely benefit from the system. So that's an area that, that needs uh, a consideration. Once you do that, and then you start to think about there's a history and presence of of medical racism and public health injustices, then you get a much different picture of why people aren't lining up for towards uh, uh, for vaccines and um, are you know saying I would never get a coronavirus vaccine no matter what that kind of thing. Then it starts to make more sense. So reciprocity means, if anything, listening to the people who are expressing that hesitancy instead of dismissing them and saying, "Well, you must be stupid or you don't understand science," and that. That, that reflective piece is missing. So reciprocity is exactly the right thing there. Thank you. Thank you. Santiago, por favor. Um, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I have a general question about the roots of this lack of trust. Uh, and I was wondering whether if we have a more expansive view of what illiteracy means, maybe there can be some roots in, in scientific illiteracy. So, so you mentioned that people have access to the papers, they have access to information, some people have a higher degrees and so on, but sometimes a lack of trust originates because of lack of understanding. And one might claim that there is some lack of understanding of how science works, 
of how a hypothesis in science are supported by the evidence, how much weight uh, the opinion of a single scientist has given the social character of science and so on. And, and here is an analogy. Um, so nowadays there are many neural networks that can give you surprisingly accurate predictions about things. And there is a, a debate about where these uh, machine learning could be used to uh, diagnose uh, things in, in medical care, for instance. And I think many people are reluctant to rely on machines. They don't know how they work. They don't understand how they yield uh, their outputs. Uh, just because uh, trust, I think, in some cases, relies on, on better understanding. So, so if we have a more expansive view of, of illiteracy, maybe uh, understand, uh, maybe it plays a role in this uh, crisis of trust. Okay, so you're you're suggesting uh, thinking about a literacy, uh, scientific literacy, differently. So the the definition I was using is is usually what um, what follows from um, national national testing of scientific literacy. You you I, countries around the world do this uh, K to they, they go kindergarten to whatever the highest uh, high school level, we call it K to 12, kindergarten to 12, and they do scientific literacy and they they compare. And it's usually very fact-based uh, understandings of science, like uh, how many fifth graders know the closest planet to the sun, that kind of thing. And there's, of course, and they, I mean, there's criticism of the questions that are asked. It doesn't really demonstrate understanding. It just demonstrates sort of facts, uh, you know, the availability of facts. But it at least gives some measures to start saying which uh, one put one country next to another, and and uh, you can use it as, you know, a political platform to either say we're great or we need to invest more money into 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 education. So the 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 kind of uh, idea, the concept of scientific literacy, you're right, is not a is not a very robust uh, concept. But um, I found myself moving away from the idea of scientific literacy when I started seeing the research into cultural cognition, which suggests that the way people, people um, let's say, evaluate claims about climate change or vaccines seems to be more reflective of their political and ideological leaning than their education. So we actually find the most polarization on vaccines, so the most acceptance and the most refusal among the highest educated uh, uh, people. And it, so it was not determined by your level of education. Um, and then when they start to parse out who are these highly educated people, suddenly your political leanings seem to matter. Um, not as much with vaccines, but definitely so with climate change. If you if you vote conservative, you don't think climate change is a big problem, and and the other way. So it, it says that that's where the the idea about epistemic trust came in. I thought maybe it has less to do with with uh, illiteracy at all, with, with scientific literacy or illiteracy at all, because the, all these markers are pointing to the way you incorporate this information into your life and into your worldview. What you seem to be suggesting is maybe we could define scientific literacy and illiteracy in a way that actually captures some of those social features. And I, I admit I, I haven't seen that kind of uh, thinking about scientific literacy done, maybe just literature I'm not aware of. Uh, thank you for making me think about that. Uh, if you do have any recommendations about uh, research on that, I'd love it if you could email me about it. Okay, good. <laughs> Gustavo, por favor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder to, to what extent uh, can you say that partisanship and political ideology determines uh, skepticism about science? Yeah, you have nowadays these, these leaders, uh, typically like populist leaders who tend to disregard science yeah and and usually people fo following donald trump or jail jail bolsonaro or many of these figures tend to have very skeptical views about climate change or about uh, wearing a mask the, the efficacy of, of of wearing a wearing a mask so it's probably because of of political reasons or or uh, economic reasons, I, I don't know, but that seems to to shape what they think about 
about science. Can, can you speak more about, uh, about the role that, that partisanship plays in this science skepticism? Um, so I, everything you describe sounds right to me, but I would say that followers of Bolsonaro or Trump are not skeptical of all forms of science. They're yeah. skeptical of the scientific claims that first of all go against policies that they support and um, and also and precisely because those scientific claims have been politicized in a way that if I, you know, as I as a let's say I'm a voting citizen in, in the United States, I feel like if I accept that climate change is a real threat, then I must accept that uh, we need bigger government and more regulation of industry. And if I'm a conservative who thinks that free market is the best way and, and deregulation is, is the best way to run a society, one consequence of that is I'm going to refuse climate change. So there's been some studies, uh, there's been some studies where they've tried to sort of disentangle the scientific claim, for example, climate change, anthropogenic climate change is real and threatening with the policy that is thought to follow from it. And then you will actually find an increase in people of both political stripes saying this, this is a, a more convergence on, on the scientific claims. It's because science has been politicized such that if you accept scientific claim, you must accept policy claim, um, the, the, this policy claim that people resist the science. I mean, it's, we live in a funny time where if you look at, let's say online blogs around climate change, you find these blockers talking about really technical minutia around climate change, like at temp, uh, like uh, surface temperatures versus water temperatures, and they're looking for all kinds of reasons that climate change uh, measurement isn't isn't uh, isn't accurate. And these are not scientists; these are not people engaged in in uh, the world of science. What they're looking for is is the end result. So the the um, the thought here is that because science has been politicized because politics is often framed in scientific language, we don't get to talk about values anymore. Instead, we talk about evidence-based policy. So it's the argument is about the science, not about the policy. Uh, because of that, you need to stake a claim in the science. And of course it gets politicized that way. Unfortunately, it's a very, it's a, it's sort of a misuse of science because science could give us all kinds of options. Instead, scientific claims get tied to a certain policy instead of opening up other possibilities. And uh, it also means that politics gets narrowed too, because we don't get to talk about values anymore. Instead, we have to fight about science. So I think that's where we where we stand in, so in terms of the relationship between uh, science and politics. So it is no wonder to me that uh, you know certain you know the populist movements will be anti-mask and anti-lockdown, but you know they don't have much to say about quantum physics, for example. They don't they don't really they probably think that's just fine. Axel, por favor. Oh, thanks a lot. This, uh, this is a great talk. Uh, I'm not. Uh, but I want to continue with this this last point because um, in your in your response to Gustavo, uh, I think you do seem to be agreeing with Dan Hicks' point that it's not so much actually about the science, but about the policies that are presented as science based, right? But but then if that is, the, I don't understand how that, I don't think that bodes very well with your trying to put then trust at the center because trust seems to be epistemic, right? So they, it seems to be that they do trust science so far as that they, they take on board the, the scientific beliefs. So I don't see how these two parts fit together in your, in your proposal, the idea that it's a matter of trust because it seems that if it was a matter of trust, it would be a matter of whether, uh, they think that the facts are right, but they agree that the facts are right. It's the policies that they don't want, right? Um, I mean, I think, uh, I guess I was saying that it's, and, and this is actually, Dan Hicks would say this too, that underlying, so underneath it, it's, it's sort of under the surface of the scientific claims and the con contestation of facts is, uh, is a genuine value disputes that don't get aired. So I don't think they accept the facts. I'm saying they're resistant to that because of the politics that are associated with it. So I would say, what if we started from the from the other end? What if our institutions were actually seen as trustworthy 
and um, working in the interest of the public. I, I know that there can be diverse publics, but working in public interest and so instead of the interests of power or the interests of corporate power, um, well, then, then the, the relationship of people to scientific facts could be much different. What if there was an allowance to say, I accept the scientific facts, but I don't accept this policy. I would like to see other policy options that don't hurt me in particular or my community in particular. We don't have that yet. Instead, we have to fight about whether climate change is real or not, which is, you know, in the end, a silly question. It's what, what follows how we respond to climate change that should be, is what we should be arguing about. Uh, can I do a follow-up or is there many? Okay. I'm, I'm still, I'm sorry, I'm still puzzled because uh, on the one hand, maybe I am misread, mishearing you, but you seem to to be say there seems to be at least a possibility of a solution by separating the scientific facts from the actual policies. So if you separated the facts from the actual policies, then there is no problem of trust in science because as long as the trust is about the facts that are independent of any policies, there is no problem, right? Yeah, That's what I you were saying to Gustavo about quantum facts and things like that. There's no problem there because those facts are not value. Sci yeah, so, so scientific claims, even what we call facts, we, we can agree they are value laden. However, mm -hmm. how much they impact people's lives will, will, will mm -hmm. vary. I use the word policy relevant science. So science that is actually impacting people's lives like agriculture and uh, environment and, uh, and health and that kind of thing. So, so, I, so I, I think it's at least been demonstrated, again, through this sort of cultural cognition research that you can remove some of the resistance people have to scientific claims by disassociating the scientific claim <clears throat> and the policy that follows. Uh, I doubt it would ever be a clean break because the relevance, the social relevance will always be present. But imagine yes. if there were mechanisms in place where we could discuss policy options instead instead of getting that very it's called uh, you might know um um pilke uh, uh pilke's work he's a, he's a science communications and sociologist has talked about the linear model from science to policy where just because of you know because politics tends to amplify and simplify in a lot of ways how one idea and one policy seem to be get attached together even though there's no reason that it needs to be that way one scientific claim could actually open the door to lots of policy options but instead we do things like uh, like climate change is real therefore kyoto or paris accord and we we limit the number of um, of options there. And, and it, it, it is a shame, partly, and it might actually reflect that scientists don't do enough advising to uh, political institutions because they're expected to present their, their papers and then a policy seems to follow from it. When if you kept the scientists in the room, you might say, let's, let's think, of, let's draft up five policy options that follow from the, from your research into the state of climate change, for example. But we, instead we, we do that sort of move from science to policy and that will always be limiting and that and because of that uh, the politicization gets gets amplified yeah oh, thank you that's very very helpful thank you thank you Fabiola, por favor. yes thank you um <clears throat> thank you very much for the talk and can you listen to me can you hear me yeah um i want to press you a bit more on the question of about the, the reasons for this uh, lack of trust. I know you've said something about that, but in your presentation, I kept waiting for you to motivate, or for you to uh, provide some sort of account of why there is this lack of trust. Because um, though I agree with you, I mean, it's very plausible, your claim, one could reply and say, oh, well, there is no trust and there is this mistrust because people just don't understand well enough because they refuse to understand. They don't want to engage with the scientific evidence and so on and so forth. So one could move one step uh, up in this, uh, in the same account, you know, place the blame on the public of why the, the and, and claim that their mistrust is now well motivated. So what I found missing in your presentation was uh, some account of 
why we ought to take this lack of trust seriously. So why this mistrust is very well motivated. So what's fueling it? What's um, causing this mistrust that um, science experts and public health officials ought to take it very seriously? I mean, I know you said some things about this. You've partially answered my question, but I wanted to, to press the point and just mention that I found missing in your presentation um, an account along these lines. Okay, um, thank you for that. That's a that's a that's a good challenge. Um, I I I don't think that the public is unwilling to engage with the science. That I don't see a lot of evidence of that. Uh, if anything, if we look at let's say uh, the the abundance of science journalism that's done and blogging and discussions, health and science journalism are extremely popular. So the public want to know science maybe don't want to know, well, that's a different story, but there's definitely a lot of public interest in it. Now, why are they interested in it? Well, partly because science is supposed to inform our decision making. We kind of, if you, if you live in, in a, in a sort of, in, in, if, if not a full democracy, but at least some kind of, of uh, societal framework where you have choices to make, we are, we look for, um, for, uh, for sources to, inform our decisions. And most of us look to scientists, scientists for that. And, and there, there's lots of national registries of this. How much do people trust science? Uh, there was actually an uptick of that in the early months of COVID. People found that more people were turning into scientific sources to learn about what's happening with this outbreak rather than, I don't know, any kind of alternative source. So I think there's a lot of public interest in in science. In fact, that seemed to be why the war on science was 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 such framed. It seemed that people were encountering science but not believing it. So why didn't they believe it? Well, they must be they must be against science or they must have some kind of um, um, bad motive around around science. But I think that this was what I what I came to understand was that this was a genuine encounter between the public and scientific information and scientific institutions and the public saying we are not satisfied with this framework. It does not represent the the needs of everyday people. And instead, it's been you know corrupted by all kinds of power interests. So uh, so. So I don't know if that does enough to motivate you. And if it doesn't, I'd love to hear why, uh, what, what you think is missing from there, Fabiola. Well, no, the only thing that's, that's missing, and maybe you just mentioned it in, in previous answers to other questions, is that um, what's motivating this lack of trust? I mean, what's going on in the relation between science and the public or the relation between public health experts or, uh, yeah, or the medical, the yeah, the, the science community and the public yeah. that is motivating this lack of trust. I mean, what happened? Right. Um, that was just the good, yeah. Yeah, so the the sources that I found dominant when I when I was researching vaccine hesitancy, at least around childhood vaccines, was um, a concern about... Um, a concern about uh, financial conflicts of interest in medicine. That is a, a, a huge theme. It, it sort of gets brushed off as conspiracy theories in some contexts, and it shouldn't be. We have too much evidence that these things happen. And regardless of what, how often it happens, the public are very concerned about it. And uh, I, uh, I, I mentioned before that I think the presence of uh, health injustices and, uh, and uh, mistreatment of marginalized communities has not been um, properly appreciated, but that is exactly why some communities are not opening their doors to public health researchers and, and uh, trying to work with uh, public health to, to try to increase vaccination and increase the health of their communities. They don't trust they don't trust the institutions that are actually tasked with keeping us safe and healthy. And because of that, you go to the internet, you can go anywhere because we put this infrastructure in place to protect the public and 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 good chunks of the good chunks of the um, Good, uh, significant, at least vocal groups of the public are not trusting of it. So I, I think, uh, I think the mistrust is is present because it, they stand so important in the way we're supposed to be governing ourselves as as citizens. Does that answer your question? 
Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so um, I had raised my hand, so it's my turn. Uh, I, I want to go back to uh, Santiago's question about understanding, because it seems to me that um, if one agree to your diagnosis of what is happening here, uh, then it's not clear that how useful this type of solutions about uh, personal engagement between uh, the medical doctor and the mother of the child uh, are gonna work. Uh, because what seems to be happening is that uh, we have this network of things that we think that are true. And even if the medical doctor is being nice to me and is trying to explain to me why vaccines work and why they are safe and so on, maybe that conflicts with other things that I that I do agree. And that's the idea of understanding, right? I, I get out of the doctor's office and I think, oh, he, he explained to me and maybe I should trust him. And suddenly I turn on my computer and start watching these documentaries from Netflix that are talking about how all these industries in science and technology are biased and are trying to harm others and so on. And that sticks in my mind. And, and it's easier to defeat the medical doctor testimony and to endorse the others. And so this, these minimal engagements seem to me to not be that efficient uh, because of understanding actually, because the role that understanding plays in public people. And maybe you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think those face-to-face -face interactions um, are more significant uh, than, you, uh, than you allow. Um, there's lots of research into into trust and trust building that says the face-to-face -face open encounter where you come to each other respectfully can have enormous consequence so even though their mother if if i'm imagining this mother who has watched this netflix and, and has all kinds of concerns she should be able to come and talk to her doctor about that and the doctor should be able to respond Perhaps that means acknowledging that there are that that the system isn't perfect and that there are corporate interests, but that might be where they can lend some uh, some uh, perspective. Like uh, measles vaccines have been around for a long time, and this is what we know about it. And maybe we want to be more cautious about newer vaccines, but let's at least talk about the ones that are well established. So that's where you kind of meet people where they are. And see if you can get some movement of it. And there's, there is, a, you know, there's no formula for doing it. I, I know they've tried. The behavioral psychologists keep trying to come up with, here's what you say to a hesitant, uh, uh, to a vaccine hesitant person, and here's, and, and, and there doesn't seem to be a, 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 a prescribed way of doing it. You just need to talk to the person, show empathy and understanding, often starting from common values like. I know you and I want what is best for your child. And you start with that common ground and you build from there and you might surprise yourself. Uh, it may not happen in one medical visit. So that's why I mentioned the re remuneration of, of doctors for their time. Uh, but uh, these these are relationships that get built and they um, they're, it's not small to think that a good connection with a healthcare provider can really motivate a parent in favor of vaccines. There's at least anecdotal evidence that a, a good talk can, can go a long way. Thank you. Um, Juan, por favor. Uh, yeah, Ms. Kuchan? Okay. Uh, thanks for that uh, great um, uh, talk. I really liked it. I just have two very quick uh, questions. And one, uh, one is already uh, picks up a little bit on what was said before, but I maybe, maybe catches a, a different dimension. Um, so I was wondering why. Uh, I mean, people who don't want to get vaccinated not only distrust science, right? They, they also distrust, distrust uh, physicians, right? So, so the medical profession, right? And so what, was, uh, what I, I don't clearly understand is why. So th they do trust their physicians for, for other issues, right? So if they want to get a cancer treatment or any other kind of, they, they do trust them with those, uh, in, in those respects, but not when it comes to to, to vaccines. So there's clearly some, some cognitive dissonance going on, right? So, uh, so my question is why? So why, uh, why uh, uh, have uh, anti-vaxxers picked up on specifically this thing? And yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so, I'm, so I guess what I'm saying is that I, I, don't, I don't see it 
if, if it is a, a trust issue, so how come they're, they're just distrusting them in this very specific uh, dimension, but not in, with respect to other? And, um, and so the, the, uh, just the one question. And then the other one very quickly is that, I mean, you mentioned that some people uh, do uh, the effort and they try to, to, to learn about science. And so they, they, they are engaging the scientific community, but they just, that's, a, that's not doing it. They still are uh, skeptical or, or, or they reject vaccine. Uh, but I guess there might be other people who don't do the, don't do the effort, right? And so with respect to those, I guess there might be a question of not only building trust uh, on the scientific community, but actually of discrediting other sources of, 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 of knowledge, right? So they, they, they just follow uh, opinion leaders. And then so that, I guess my question is, there's also a job of discrediting uh, a few leaders that, that are, or a few like sources of opinion that, um, that, that, that also might complement the, uh, the so, so those are my questions. Um, so the first question was, what is it about vaccines that there's more resistance around it? And these are by people that are not entirely, it, it, at least for the most part, are not entirely rejecting biomedicine as a whole. So vaccines seem to be a particular flashpoint uh, because uh, for a few reasons. One, they involve children. So they um, that will get people emotional. Um, uh, another is that they are preventive instead of a treatment base. When you have cancer, you want to do something about your cancer. Um, and a third one is because they are tied to political mandates. We don't get to talk about vaccines as an individual health choice. Uh, it's always got further consequences, you know, access to school and sometimes tax breaks and uh, and, and that kind of thing. So some people might be okay with vaccines, but they're not okay with being told that they need to do it in order to, to in order to get their children into school or, or something like that. So um, vaccines are, uh, are are politicized in that way. So that's why they get special attention in a way that other healthcare um, healthcare uh, technologies don't. Um, your next question. I'm sorry, I can't remember. Your next question was uh, it was about discrediting of experts. Well, um, oh, so-called experts. So-called experts. Yeah, there's uh, the the terrain of expertise around vaccines is quite strange. Uh, I, I argue against that idea about expertise being dead, the death of expertise. Instead, we seem to have more experts than we ever had before. We have, uh, you know, the sort of traditional doctor in a white coat, public health uh, specialist with a PhD. But now we've got these sort of alternative experts, and some of them are interesting insofar as they are valued because not because they're completely alternative, like a you know a naturopath or, or a Hollywood star, but some of them are particularly valued because they are insider outsiders, like uh, trained in biomedicine uh, physicians who are now taking the minority view on vaccines. Something of Andrew Wakefield, for example, and there's. Uh, a number of them, and they are quite celebrated because they say, you see, even the doctors don't trust vaccines. So they're seen as as particularly valuable in this movement that it's not just alternative and outside of science, but even the scientists discredit it. So, so the sort of terrain of expertise is getting more complicated. And I think that's largely got to do with the that sense that due to financial conflicts of interest, that the community of knowers is not well, that there's something corrupt about these communities of knowers. So suddenly the uh, insider outsider like Andrew Wakefield is seen as um, more established and has more integrity because he can truth, he can speak truth to power in the way that other physicians are allegedly not willing to do. Abelia, por favor. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I, I really like your idea about uh, that, that blaming the, the public for uh, disinformation or skepticism can be really harmful and that it actually widens the gap between the public and the experts. Uh, but nonetheless, I think there's this sector of the population that has been prey of uh, conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theories. Like they exist and they're very loud, very vocal in the social media. And the thing with them is that they seem to be shielded to any other knowledge, right? 
like whatever you cannot prove nor disprove their beliefs and uh, no matter what like uh, fact checking or anything that it won't convince them otherwise so my question is to, in this specific sector how do you build pu public trust like how do you pierce into those shields uh to make them to make uh well at least a dialogue not just saying like okay this is establishment um uh, uh changing the, the 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 logic but it's still the same uh, game so how do you um talk to these people or or make those bridges um that um that is a difficult question i'm not and i don't actually think i have a good answer to that so um vaccine hesitators this has been this is recognized uh in public health research they're they're along a spectrum obviously some are a little bit hesitant some are a lot hesitant and the thinking is is that you can you you might be able to convince people that are sort of moderately hesitant sort of right in the middle or, or slightly hesitant, but there's going to be a section of people, usually they are the vaccine refusers, that maybe cannot be accessed. They are just so rigid in their views that probably anything you say isn't gonna change their minds. Where conspiracy theorists come in, I'm thinking of like the QAnon phenomena happening right now. Um, they are similarly probably impervious to discussion because at least as much as I can, I, I'm not a researcher of, uh, of conspiracy theories, but so all my knowledge of QAnon is really just based on media reporting is that um, they are as unfalse, their claims are as unfalsifiable as they can be. Uh, there is no fact checking. Anything you say to try to fact check it is seen as a, as a, as a point of, of, of fighting. So now you're hearing stories about, you know, my, I don't talk to my mom anymore because she's QAnon. And so they're, they're now being compared to more like a cult where you are supposed to just, where the, 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 what follows is you disassociate with people who do not accept your point of view. And because of that, the kind of persuasion and soft relationship building that I'm suggesting may not work in this kind of situation. I think this might actually be a separate category, more on the side of rigid refusal. So I, I don't have a good answer for that. And I, watching to see what what happens around that because it's you know it, it's obviously very concerning and it's much more than vaccines now it's it seems like it's a complete different framework of of viewing a lot of things yeah thank you maya anybody has any following ups or any questions um if not me oh, oliver please We, do, we cannot hear you. Great, thank you. Uh, great talk and uh, really good Q&A as well. Thank you, everyone. Um, this question is going to rather overlap with ones that have come before, but I just thought I'd throw this in. Uh, there's a big school of thought in um, psychology and philosophy that would argue that well-educated people might refuse information and education when this clashes with beliefs that are somehow partly constitutive of their identity or sense of self or something like that. And um, I think this is probably rather friendly to your explanation in terms of trust, but I'd just like to know uh, if anywhere, if, if this school of thought just diverges with you on this issue or if it's um, entirely part of the same explanation. I think it does. I think you're referring to the work on motivated cognition or cultural yeah. cognition. Yeah. And that was uh, uh, in my research that uh, that had a, a large presence. It's actually what was sort of getting me away from as I was trying to think through like what is it about the evidence? Why don't what evidence is going to convince people to finally vaccinate? That was my sort of leading question when I started this research. And I started through communications research and exposure to that uh, cultural cognition research and started to think maybe that's the wrong question. It isn't a question about what scientific claim or what scientific evidence is there, but sort of how instead it's got we've got questions about how claims about vaccines fit into your worldview, and that's that's true if you're educated and if you're if you're uneducated. So that that was uh, uh, I write about it quite a bit uh, in in the book project, and you probably sensed it that that was uh, motivating my thinking in this in this uh, research talk too. So thank you for noticing that. Um, it seems to, to, to diverge um, slightly, maybe in the case of 
uh, more obviously in the case of vaccines than with climate change. It seems that um, the reasons you stated climate change policy often does um, threaten, say, certain North Americans' sense of self. Uh, and it might also threaten, you know, the way of life of people in the developing countries who, who don't want restrictions on growth and things like that. But how is it that um, vaccinations threaten people's sense of self? I suppose the idea of naturalness might be an example, but are there other examples? Yeah, there there are. Um, so there, the, 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 it keeps shifting, but at least when I first started research into it, um, vaccination was not politically polarized in the same way that climate change was, where we you kind of had conservative versus progressive on whether you agree that climate change was a real thing. Vaccine Vaccination had acceptors both on the conservative and the uh, more liberal side, as well as refusers on both sides. So uh, vaccine acceptors might be um, liberal people with a sense of community. They like the communitarian aspect of we all do this together, we all vaccinate collectively. And you also had on the conservative side, people that believed in hierarchies in terms of you know gender, professional expertise were accepting it. You do what the doctor says, you listen. Uh, as for refusers, you kind of had this sort of West Coast natural uh, lifestyle people that refuse vaccines. Uh, but you also had libertarians more on the right who said, you don't get to tell me what to do with my body. So those were the political spectrum. And I remember early on people saying, whatever happens, don't allow vaccines to get politicized in the same way that climate change does. And then, because then we're doomed. And then of course, vaccines did get much more politicized. Even though the more vocal resistors are still kind of left leaning, you're seeing much more of the folding of vaccines into populist movements like in, you know, you know when Donald Trump and, and uh, uh, Italian populist leaders speak out against vaccines, well, that's that's po politicizing it over over to the right. So it still sort of remains to be seen where we land on vaccines. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if there are not any more questions, maybe we can thank Maya. Thank you, Maya, for this amazing talk. It was great to have you here. And uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, your questions were amazing. and. Uh, uh, difficult and thoughtful, and I really appreciate that. Uh, I hope you'll keep in touch. I'm, I'm putting my email in the chat if you want to email me with any further questions. Thank you. Maybe Tere wants to say something? Oh, I, I, I would like to thank Maya again, and also Maria and Angeles for organizing uh, the talk. And we'll see you next week. Okay, be safe. Bye, thank Bye. you. Thank you.